I think they're all in, or well, 72 now, and we've got joint. Um, so I'm going to just share the screen to start with for everyone and just remind people what our subject matter was and, uh, and of course, our panellists. Firstly, um, uh, I'm Simon Bliss. I'm the new chairman at TEAM. Really looking forward to, A, this webinar and, and a suite of web webinars that we're going to be running for our, our members um, over the next few months and, and throughout 2021. I've got together um, some of the some core team service providers that you all know and, and supported team brilliantly over the years. And this, this webinar is the title is the Lockdown Antidote. And it's specifically to try and help um, some of our members grab some business now uh, and hopefully get some billing in before Christmas or at least start that pipeline for 2021. And uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to let my wonderful panellists introduce themselves. I've, in my little uh, section, I've got Christina first. So, Christina, please introduce yourself for those that don't know you. Um, yeah, so I'm Christina from Green Umbrella Marketing. We are a digital marketing agency helping recruiters predominantly with their social media presence, but we also do lots of content creation, so blogging, that kind of thing, email marketing. Lots and lots of different stuff. Um, and we've been team service providers for, I think, about nine years now. Thank you very much, Christina. You've been a, you've been a, yeah, a member as long as me. Um, and Wendy, it is ladies first. So perhaps oh. you go first. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, exciting to be online and support this. And uh, I'm Wendy McDougall, Chief Fish of Farfish, if anybody doesn't know me. Um, Farfish is a, a recruitment um, CRM, but also marketing um, system as well. Um, love team, um, really supportive of the network. Um, and I was a board member, I think, six years ago as well, um, up in Scotland, and, uh, and uh, have been really loving seeing the team network grow uh, and I think just seeing recruiters being nice to one another and help one another is, is very unique in the market so it's a special network to be involved in. Thank you Wendy. I love the job title as well, Chief Fish. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether or not Jeremy's Chief Duck. So. Well, <laughs> yes. out of my mouth but I'm handing over to last but very not least Jeremy. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Jeremy Snell. I run a business called Talent Builder we're an online training and learning platform for recruiters where we deliver bite-sized training on a weekly basis for uh, anyone who's looking to become more productive and more efficient. Uh, this guy up here, this is Willis the Goose, um, also known as Goose Willis, and uh, he is Chief Goose and I am Second Lieutenant Goose. Thank you very much and, and well explained. It's also, yeah, it is good to know the hierarchy. Now, um, <laughs> on the agenda, we had uh, winning business in the next six weeks, which I guess is now five weeks now, because we've got, with time is running out for us before Christmas. Um, and we were going to focus on existing customers, lapsed customers, and then avatars of existing spending clients to narrow your focus and looking at intelligent new business, focusing on purpose, on purpose for prospects. So I've, I've got a few questions because I know who some of the some of the people that focused on that. Jeremy, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you the idea of selling to existing customers. Don't you think most people are already doing this? To some extent, however, I think the the reality of how much they're truly doing it compared to their their belief that they are is is sometimes different. Uh, I, I think sometimes we can end up with a customer and we treat them too much like a customer and therefore assume that they'll continue to be giving us their business. So there are probably businesses out there where you would consider them to be a client, yet there may be managers who you don't have relationships with, or you may even have work from them today that you, you, you could focus on turning into, into revenues for this month before you start thinking about trying to find some new business from some strangers. So there are a lot of opportunities within an existing client base to be able to, to increase the average spend per customer and just get better at delivering to, to people who already want to recruit through you. If you've got live jobs today, it makes sense to close those out before you start looking for more business. No, well, well thank you. Thank you for that. Um, 
ladies, is there any either of you want to comment on that one on the 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 assumption that uh, perhaps people aren't ex aren't maximising their potential with existing customers? Any, anything you either of you want to add to that? Um, although I've got some specific questions for you too. Well. Yeah, no, I mean I, I can chip in a little bit there. I, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure it'll be the, the same as Christina, uh, Christina as well. But I, I think just in what Jeremy's saying, it's amazing what we think we're doing. And when actually we see the data in front of us, it mm -hmm. gives us a much more clear picture of how many customers we've actually been in contact with in the last six months or the last three months. You know, where is my target customer? So I'm all about using the data and sort of making it light up with those sort of like visual indicators to actually remind the recruiter that actually, you know, time has passed. I can't believe that we're in November. So if I'm thinking that in terms of this, mm -hmm. where this year has gone, it's probably been a year since you may have touched base with some of your clients that you had last year doing a lot of business. But in your head, you may think it was only three months ago that you touched base with them. So I think a really good thing to do right now to identify where to spend your time, because we've got to maximize the next few weeks before it's um, passed over into Christmas, is actually just spending a good time on your database, getting your top 100 sort of customers that you've done some business with, that could be getting a job report, who you've done business with, and then effectively putting them in, into a sort of sliding scale or just making sure you've got an automatic indicator that will demonstrate how many you've actually dealt with in the last six months and who's missing out. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. that. That's a good one. Um, Jeremy, I've got one more for you now. We're just focusing on the sales and, and, and I'll come on to some marketing questions in a little while. So, Christina, don't worry. Um, Jeremy, how would you recommend that team members close out the existing uh, work that they have already before Christmas? Because lots of people have got pipeline stuff at the moment, even despite lockdown. Yeah, and I think I think that look, I'm 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 sorry to say this. I think sometimes things like the event we're in now, this lockdown, can become an excuse for things dragging out. And sometimes recruiters sell to themselves. It's okay that I haven't heard from them today because we're in this lockdown. So it's about setting some priorities and, and creating um creating goals and objectives as to what you can do with each of the live pieces of work that you've got today to be able to ensure that you are taking it towards becoming a, a definite placement. I spoke to somebody yesterday, yesterday evening, who's, who's the MD of a, a, a recruitment business who, who told me about a, a deal that they had within their organization. The placement fee was £11,500. The offer was accepted two months ago and no one had spoken to the candidate since and they were due to start next week and they've now discovered that the candidate's not going. But I would consider that to be work that needs to be looked after to make sure that it actually turns into an invoice and the invoice gets paid. But because they were, they were so focused on always moving forwards with new business, the existing portfolio was kind of left to, to look after itself. Um, so it's, it, it's about being a bit more conscious of what business do we have and when did we last speak to them and, and, and when actually do we expect that this is going to convert and, and, and how do we make sure that we're we're on it proactively. Mm. Okay. No, th thank you very much for that. Uh, Christina, I've got, uh, I've got something for you now. And I think it's down to, it is truly marketing, but the, the other two feel free to come in. Um, I was keen to know how important it is for any time, how important is your personal brand on LinkedIn and your professional brand on your website to be on point? Um, and, and, how can you sense check that? You know, if it's not, how do you sense check that? Okay, so first of all, now more than ever, you've really got to have everything tied up. You've got to have that consistency of brand. And I still come across people now that think, think of their brand as being the logo and a color, but actually it's so much more. It's the whole kind of feel. It's, it's very much, it's intrinsic, an intrinsic part of your message. So making sure that that, that is all there. Um, in terms of kind of auditing it, it really is a case of actually look at what you put out there. You know, are you, is everything consistent? 
are you saying you know we should be doing x and then two posts later it's like we should be doing y it's it's just looking at the the overall messaging um obviously yeah we work with a, a lot of the recruiters within team looking at how all of this plugs together the different tools that they're using so that whether it's a linkedin post or email marketing whether it is something on their website that, that the consistency of message is there but I think now more than ever, the personal brand element of it, this is the only way you're going to get through to people. This is the way you, you step out of the crowd. This is the way that you make sure you are the recruiter of choice. So I just think it's, it's such an important thing. What I would add, and it kind of ties into the couple of questions we've had already, is that don't forget what you do today from a marketing perspective actually has an effect in three months time and six months time so you know your marketing right now is very much about account-based marketing so looking at the people that you've been putting your marketing messages out to already what were they responses what what were their responses and how do you dig into that go back to those activities that you implemented in quarter one this year or even this time last year and actually what did you not follow up with then this, I spoke to a recruiter within team in the last week. They sent an email campaign. They'd had an amazing number of clicks off the back of this campaign. I'm like, brilliant. What did you do next? Nothing. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, is there anyone who wants to add anything to that? And I'm going to make some comments about brand because just just before you do. And if I'd thought about my brand or team's brand, firstly, I probably wouldn't have had the window open behind me there. And I'd have made sure that the team banner was to the side so that I can read it. Um, Jeremy's got his, his nice clean goose up there to the right. Wendy's got fire fish to the right of her. So she's got her brand nice and clear and green umbrella is behind you perfectly. And I'm the one who hasn't thought about it enough. And had I been doing this again, I certainly stand out as what not to do. I should be making sure that I've got the messaging behind a lot better, cleaner, or have a green background like some of you guys have got. So there's an example of bad process. And anyone, anybody want to chip in, either Wendy or Jeremy, on that, on that importance of brand? Um, I, I hope you don't mind. I've got a slightly different opinion on things. I think it starts to fall apart when we look at branding and marketing and sales as being siloed activities, because then we plan them as siloed activities. And that's when you end up with incongruence between each of the messages and what, and what you do. I'd rather people thought about today, I'm going to be working and I'll be working on ensuring that I have a future pipeline of customers and I serve the ones I've got to the best of my ability. And that kind of glues together the whole kind of marketing sales and branding piece rather than feeling as though we're turning switches on and off that we're in sales mode and let's go out of sales mode and now I'm going on to LinkedIn to do some marketing. It's, it, it's all one and the same to me. Okay. Um, Wendy, anything to add? I, I like just, approach. Yeah, I was just going to, again on branding, it's a really good question from um, Elke Holland. I was just actually typing away on the, the questions and answers there. And um, yes, this is a, a virtual background, um, but what I did was um, I wanted, uh, the, the, the aquarium for us as our office is very important as part of our company. And you know, it looks pretty funky because that is my actual office. So I got somebody just to go in and take um, a number of different views of my office. So five different views of the office. And you know, I can come in and I can then go and choose different views of my office and show them around, you know, our culture. Now, okay, there's nobody sitting there, but they get a good really sense of feel of, of what sort of company we are in terms of the background that I'm then showing. So, you know, we could be talking about my big desk, you know, my deck chair and stuff. And it's a really good way of introducing virtually, you know, actually more about us. So we use our culture as well as just brand to build that story um in terms of introducing ourselves to our to our customer and that's part of the brand i hope uh, that helps elke and it stops me um El is it elke i think it is and um, stops yeah. me from typing so i'll just delete that one and say i've answered it all right <laughs> good 
good things. Thank you very much indeed. Um, actually, while, while you're on, Wendy, I, I, a, a key question that some people have already asked me before coming on is, why is automation so really important at the moment uh, in the recruitment processes? Yeah, because if you think about it, how much you've all had to suddenly do in your businesses, I mean, I don't know if you're, I mean, I'm, I'm running a sort of 45 man business now, but I've never worked as hard um, this year as I did when I was launching the business and I had one or two people in the business, you know, because essentially we've all had to pick up so many different tasks. So the more as a, a one or a five man organization that you can automate, it's so important. Um, if you think about the, the number of candidates that you're getting on board, you know, you, it used to be very candidate driven, then it went client driven. I am hearing some of the sectors, it's actually still gone back. A lot of candidates are worried about changing moves. So it's going back a little bit more to candidate driven, but you're bouncing from one to the next type of market. So the more that you can automate those processes, the more time that you or your recruiters can actually spend with the people that you're actually making money for because ultimately you've got to swap your recruiters or yourself around from just having chats every chat you should have right now is the time to make sure you've got an outcome so you can't take the time to talk to absolutely everybody i appreciate you would like to because customer service is up there but you really have to have a way of filtering the ones that you can make money from because you've only got you know, a couple, three weeks this side of Christmas to make money. So that's where you've got to use the automation to allow this sort of low touch, but still polite and nice way of being able to communicate them automatically ha happen for you. And that can be done through technology really easily. Thank you. Um, that, that, that's, that's a great point. Uh, any, any of you, um, any points on technology, Jeremy or Christina, you want to, to add to that? Jeremy, was that a wave? No, I, was, I wondered if Christina, I'm sure Christina yeah. has, has, has some, some thoughts and ideas on this. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the thing is, if you've got the right tech stack, you can see what's happening right from like, you know, from that point they've hit your website for the first time all the way through the email marketing that you sent out there, who's responded. Um, and obviously, you know, if you're using something like Firefish, for example, you know, understanding actually who's doing what and when and you know, get, getting those kind of those green lights to say, these are the people we need to pick up the phone to. Wendy touched on this already when she was talking about data earlier, and I think it's a really good point to also bring in what Jeremy was saying about marketing and sales working together. I am forever drawing funnels, and right next to them, I'm kind of saying like, you know, your top two thirds of your funnel, that's your marketing. And then you get to this bit where marketing and sales cross over. And I think this is, this is the, the, like, the black hole, if you like. Because people go, oh, well, I don't know how to market to them anymore because they don't realise the activity they need to do right then. It's almost it's that actually now I need to put that label on them to say that they're a suspect or a prospect and I need to go down that journey now. And there, there is this kind of grey area where things cross over. So you need to take the data that you have and kind of apply that logic to it. You know, the data is showing you through people's behaviours that they're engaged, they are, they're ready to buy. Yeah. And even though we've got all this crazy happening out there, no one really knows what's going on. Those markers that people want, to, the markers that tell us that people want to buy, they are still there. We still need to follow those through and, and follow, you know, take those actions. Can I add something to that as well, please, Simon? Yeah, fire away. The whole idea about that funnel where in the top marketing and sales is lower down. It's quite a blurred line between the two things. And there's a question in the chat from Beverly who's asking about how consultants, how can she help her consultants who say people aren't answering the phone because they're working from home or in this lockdown thing. I think that becomes the, the proof of why marketing is so important for salespeople. Because when you phone and leave a voicemail message for somebody and they've engaged with three pieces of content on LinkedIn or, or they've seen a video that's an evergreen video that you have hosted on your website that you put into an email campaign. Those are the triggers that then associate your name and your company with something else that they've interacted with that you may not be aware that they've even looked at. Um, I've, had, I've had two phone calls in the last week from people who've started the phone call with, 
can I just double check? Are you the goose guy? And the, the, like this goose thing, this goose thing, this goose thing is starting to create something that is creating an association. And, and, and I know that branding is far more than the goose, right? It doesn't have to be a goose. It could be an armadillo, but I don't have a pet armadillo. But the, the whole activity that we're doing to be able to create position, to be able to create awareness, to be able to create brand is so that salespeople get more people answering the phone. They get more responses to voicemails that, that they leave. And without the marketing, it becomes much harder because you're, you're a goose in the fog and, and no one knows who you are. I, I think uh, Beverly raised a really good point about it is difficult to get hold of people now. Uh, you know, they're not, they're, they're at home. Maybe their, their connectivity and their VoIP phones don't ring directly like they would on their desk in their office. So they're on mobiles. Yeah. So we've had problems at principal people uh, with my other hat on getting hold of clients because they're working from home. Um, one of the texts we've used, if we're talking about tech and marketing, is the video, the video interview, and we use interview. There's some great products out there. Odro is another one. Uh, people are responding to those video mails mm -hmm. uh, better than they were the mails. We're, if you look in your inbox, we're, we're all getting bombarded with email marketing at the moment. But and and I know Andy Dunn, one of our regional directors, has had tr tremendous results with his Odro personal emails, not bulk ones, um, targeting potential potential clients as well as existing clients, laps clients with that video tool. And, and that's, that's, uh, that's been a, a hurdle to try and get hold of people to answer, you know, those individuals will have a hundred videos in their inbox. If there's a video, sorry, a hundred emails in their inbox, mm -hmm. if there's a video one there, it's more likely to get answered if it's really personal and it has some engagement. Um, thank you for that. Um, we've got lots of great questions. and I know Wendy's firing some answers, so thank you very much for that, Wendy. I'm going to try and get, I'll go through those at the end if we can. I've got a, <clears throat> a few other questions here I want to pose to the panel. Um, uh, I don't necessarily want to jump away from existing customers now completely, but Jeremy, um, why would you turn your attention to LAPS customers during the lockdown? Uh, you, you put it on the list. I think it's an important subject. Um, but uh, can we can we answer that one, please? Yeah, and uh, and from my perspective, lockdown or no lockdown, I always think that the best place to start with your sales is where it's going to be easiest to get conversion, which is why I would start sales with, with existing customers, and I would start sales with existing customers with customers who are currently in hiring mode with us to make sure that we we turn it into business. So if we imagine that money is the centre of the the target, like a bullseye the concentric rings that then come out from that, the, the next ring out is lapsed customers. So somebody who has worked with you in the past who isn't currently on your existing client portfolio, they may have stopped hiring because their business went into a quiet period. And now we're in the lockdown, maybe their business has now gone into a busy period and, and perhaps they're acting as though they've forgotten us because they may perceive that our behavior is we've forgotten them and just unconsciously we drift apart, which goes back to what Wendy was saying. Your memory of when you last spoke to somebody feel, always feels more recent than the reality of when it happened. Because you can look at your CRM system thinking that you spoke to them last month and seven months has gone by. And the last time you spoke to them was the end of March, beginning of April at the beginning of lockdown one. So actually making sure that you've got good quality cadence cycles for communication with existing and lapsed customers should reduce the number of existing customers that lapse and then we'll bring more of those lapsed customers back in back into the customer portfolio um, and i'm sure that there are customers out there that some people chose to get rid of and they may still be living with the reasons why they decided to walk away from them that could be linked to somebody who's even no longer in that business anymore so it's that consistency of making sure that our, our lapsed customers aren't actually hiring through somebody else and, and we're missing out on money. Mm. That, that's a great, that's a great example. Um, I, I, I had a meeting this morning with some of the, uh, the team at Principal People and one of the guys that had been working in manufacturing, uh, which had gone quiet in that particular sector of manufacturing, manufacturing is a broad, broad church. 
they hadn't given uh, Tom a job for a year, but he kept in touch with them. And all of a sudden, things have picked up. Uh, some orders have come through for them. And he's got three jobs. Now, that's a record for that client. You know, we're in health and safety. We tend to get one job at a time. But, um, uh, because the population is 0.5% of the working population working safely. So he got three jobs from just keeping in touch with a client that wasn't doing very well uh, in, in lockdown, uh, but he kept in touch and um, didn't go somewhere else. So good old Tommy, good war story for, for him. Um, uh, Christina or Wendy, anything to focus on with LAPS, uh, LAPS customers? And I agree with you, Jeremy, lower hanging fruit. Ladies, no, we covered that one. Well, I think I'm all, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's been covered, but I think also I'm just very much advocate of um, thinking outside the box. You know, as recruiters, we all tend to think just about candidates and about jobs and about money, but there's so many other things that recruiters are awesome about, which Christina will, will um, talk about is like building up an asset base of value in terms of content. Having those things to send back and just stay in touch, it gives you an excuse to contact them. You know, sending little things through the post, you know, we're all at home, we're all getting deliveries. Why not that delivery coming straight from you? That reminds them it's a nice warm feeling and you're going to be, um, you know, remembering that brand and that person. So I'm always about think outside, think outside the box and think about different things that you can do that will automatically then um, give you business when they are looking. Yeah, that's a good one, which actually prompts me to ask Christina. Uh, Christina, what trends are you seeing in terms of recruitment marketing that are bringing results? Um, so it's agility. You, you've got to be agile with marketing right now. So one of the things, and I, I was going to kind of jump in off the back of, of what Wendy said, I have a massive frustration right now when it comes to anything print related and this isn't just recruiters, it's, it's all my clients in all my sectors, okay? And they're kind of go, oh yeah, there's no point sending anything in print because no one's in the office. I'm really sorry, I don't believe that there is a single business that hasn't checked their post since mid-March. You know, and people are expecting the goodies to start arriving in the post over the next sort of four weeks. So, you know, Yes, budgets are smaller and, you know, we've got to be a, maybe a bit more kind of tactful of what we're doing and, you know, a bit, bit more considerate, but there's actually still quite a lot we can do. And if you're focusing on that sort of neck of your funnel, actually, maybe there's just 10 clients, you know, 10 people that you're not working with now that you should be. Okay, and actually you can do something really, really personalized for them that's really, really... Um, you know, that they, it's going to feel like, a, you know, it's from Wendy to me. It's not from Firefish. You know, right now we're all desperate for these personal relationships. So actually, if I send something to Jeremy and it's, you know, hand signed from Christina with a kiss on the end, it's another bit of marketing. But actually, that emotion that stirred, oh, Jeremy, you know, Christina's <laughs> thinking of me. You know, it's that kind of thing. Actually, you want people to have that feeling towards you from a personal perspective, towards your brand. A few years ago, I wrote an article about, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do is in digital marketing actually comes back to stuff that is hundreds of years old. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of need. Essentially, we all want to be a little bit loved, right? Well, so do your clients. So actually, how do we make our marketing more personal? And as things are changing, how, how can we be the agile service provider? Okay, and whether that's looking at, okay, I've got LinkedIn posts scheduled for two weeks, and now all of a sudden I need to go in and edit and reword things, or whether, and this is probably more Jeremy's area than mine, whether you're then thinking, actually, this is now happening, what's the impact in the supply chain? You know, what, how can I be the education piece for my clients so that they can be agile in their businesses. I don't know if I've answered that 100% or not, but... Yeah. And anything to add uh, from the rest of the panel? I think it, all of it comes down to just being human beings, interacting with human beings. Um, 
Uh, and and we we are we are physically distanced, but we're we're still craving social interaction. Uh, and there are probably like this is my fantasy. Well, this isn't my fantasy. This is one of my many fantasies. This is a minor fantasy in my world. That there are managers out there working from home saying, I wish I had more phone calls because all I have to talk to are the four walls and 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 my my other half. Do you, do you know? And actually, if I did receive a phone call from somebody who I thought was interested in me and therefore interesting, I would probably give them 25 minutes. Whereas if I was at work with enough social interaction, they'd probably get two and a half minutes. So it is worth putting the energy and effort into creating a conversation, which is why I really like the, the whole idea of the, the micro videos that you can send through to people to be able to capture a bit of attention and inspire a little bit of trust that you're worth talking to. Yeah, I think that's terrific. I, one, one, one of the things my guys, uh, Naz, in our contract desk, he's always uh, getting me to go to uh, Christmas drinks with um, our top uh, contractors who, who actually we make a lot of money off, but because they're quite senior guys, we put them in an interim role as head of safety or head of fire and they give us jobs. So we, we, they probably give us more business than some of our biggest corporate c clients. Um, we can't have drinks with them this year. So the guys have sent, we've, we've, they've, they've planned to do a house party and they've sent them all a case of beer or wine and we're logging on in two weeks time to have our Christmas house party. So they've got that, Simon, that's brilliant. I, I, well, it, was, it wasn't my idea, it was as Naz's. So good luck, thank you much, very much for him. But that, that has put that little community together and they loved, they, several of them have been with us a few years and they come and meet the guys they meet once a year who work in other sectors or with other businesses. Oh, well, you're still contracting for principal people. Good to see you again. And uh, no, it's, it's, it was a lovely creative thing to do. Brilliant. And it cost next to nothing. We sent, you know, my trip to Costco uh, and a hundred and fifty pound later, and it's done. And we, one of our contractors, I, we worked out, has given us three hundred thousand pounds worth of business over the six years we've worked with him. Um, that we've made out of him and jobs he's given us. So um, I've, I'm going to push on because I want to try and finish this about. 115 and then then we cover some really good questions that we've that are, that have come up uh, in in the question list um jeremy i've got one for you and you mentioned it in in the agenda what exactly do you mean when you say avatars when you're talking about focusing i think we said in our in on the agenda we said um avatars of existing spending clients narrow your focus so what mm. do you mean What do I mean by that? Uh, well, firstly, whoever is hiring through you today, there are probably companies who look like that who are hiring not through you today, but somebody else. I.e., when your customers are recruiting, your not customers are probably recruiting too. So when a business in your customer base is busy, if you can find five other businesses that look like that firm, it's likely that they're experiencing the same events in their company. And what you then have is you have a very compelling socially driven piece of proof that you can deliver in that environment because you've got a, a case study that you can share already and there are there are some sectors at the moment and, and uh, micro economies that are, are doing particularly well because of what's going on around us at the moment so when you find one of them the chances are there will always be another three or four that exist and then they'll have their own supply chain as well that sits around it um, you, you, 10 avatars that you could identify this week of, of existing customers could give you uh, a pipeline of potential work to start recruiting on for next week. Yeah, that's good. A anything else to add on the avatar front, Christina or Wendy? Um, yeah, I, I have. So I would just be really, really aware how important it is to drill down into behaviours but also, if you've done the work on avatars previously, if you kind of feel like that's, you know, yeah, I've got that box ticked, I'm fine with that. Right now, so many behaviours have changed mm -hmm. that we actually need to go back to that again. And um, I think John Stanton's asked a question, 
he's saying he's got um, you know, different locations. What's the best way of, of marketing to, to those people? And, you know, normally I would be saying in his situation, you know, Facebook advertising is going to be a really good way of getting people in your location, um, getting their attentions and, you know, a really good, strong lead magnet to try and, you know, get them offering you some data in terms of email addresses, that kind of thing. But right now, because of the massive trend we're seeing in e-commerce, anything that is like online paid social ads, it's so expensive that I actually think you're better off to just go, right, I'm gonna leave it for now. As soon as I hit that date where it's, you know, it's, it's too close to Christmas, people can't post out the last minute presents anymore. As soon as I hit that point, <laughs> That's when I would be looking at doing social ads right now. We've got to think really, really differently. All these behaviors are changing. And again, it's like, it, it's that agile thing. If you've created audiences, I say in Facebook, in LinkedIn, whatever it is that you've used for your ads previously, there's probably some changes there. You don't just assume that because you did your, you sat in a workshop or you listened to a webinar and you ticked that box when you first started your business or last this time last year, there's going to be some real changes to that avatar right now. It might go back to how it was before. So don't like, you know, throw baby out with the bathwater, but just be really reflective. Actually, are those habits still the same? Okay. Uh, I've, I've got another question for Wendy um, and it might, it might be Jeremy's answer as well. But, and, and, I think some people are pretty exhausted this year. They've been, they've, they've had ups and downs and they uh, business started to pick up again. And then we've gone into lockdown again, which has certainly affected some of our members. Um, what can you do if you just don't feel like doing business development? <laughs> Wendy, <you've been laughs> it's a tough one, but, um, I'm sure, I'm sure Jeremy is the expert on this one, but, um, uh, you know, to, to chip in, cause I felt like that as well everyone's human because you're, you're absolutely right. This has definitely been a marathon this year and it's not over. Great news about the vaccine, but it's not over and we've got to keep keep going. So, you know, I, I, this is about a state of mind, okay? And this is about trying to understand why you're not wanting to go and reach out and break down those barriers. Um, and then actually give yourself a sort of structure. I found that this is a better way for me to do it in terms of, you know, I absolutely hate cold calling. I don't agree with it. And I think it's pointless if you haven't got a reason for calling, um, some content to give them or something of value. I, you know, it just, I, I've looked at all the stats in the last 10 years. It, for me, it's just a numbers game that is pointless in terms of getting a reaction. So straight look back at your business development and get away from this mindset of here's 20 customers. I've just got to call them all. And that's me doing my business development. It's not, you can be much more smarter with that. Start to think about it. I had a, a great um, comment on the, the questions there as well, where he was trying to get through the gatekeepers, was trying to look at, you know, eight target customers. This is about using the data to segment. Think about those eight target customers. How could you interact with them by inviting them to a round table and getting a panel discussion in terms of, you know, actually getting them saying, hey, we'd like to get your expertise. Everyone's liking to being inviting to these lovely panels for their thoughts. So so do that in your industry and that gives you an audience of your eight target customers together they've met somebody of interest in their circle as well and you know what where Christina kicks in for the marketing so that's the Jeremy part and the marketing part coming through from Christina that will record it and that will give you about a month's different content um, options to then go and publish out in terms of well this came up about Brexit or this came up about this challenge and then you've got value to go and extend from those eight people that you were targeting to double that to 16. For me that is my way of business development is always adding value. Thank you that's a, that's a really good one. Uh, uh, panelists anything to add? What can, what, just reminding you of that question, what can, what can you do when you just don't feel like business development or picking up the phone? Go back to that. You know, I, I think it's, I was, the first call I was on this morning, I was asked a, question, a similar question and my, my instant response is the same. What are you in the business of? 
Okay, what, what are you really, really in the business of? Why are you doing what you do? Okay, because actually, if in those moments you can come back to that and you can just focus on delivering the value to people that is completely aligned to that, the opportunities will come through. You'll get those little, those little flurries of excitement, those little buzzes that you are used to having that kind of kickstart again and, and get you back in the game, and get you back in the right mindset. And I 100% believe that. Now, don't get me wrong. You can't just spend the next five weeks just doing that every morning. And you've got to do the work as well and, you know, and have a good hard look in the mirror sometimes as well. And go, right, you know, are we going to do this today or not? But actually, in those moments where you just think, oh, you know, I've had enough, actually, you know, I always say it's not about the money you make. It's about how you make it. And this yeah. is the thing, go right back to that room. What are you in the business of? Okay, I'm not in the business of putting posts out on LinkedIn for recruiters. I'm in the business of helping independent recruiters stand proud, shoulder to shoulder with the giants and not care because they're so committed to their brands and what they're doing and confident in it that they're going to get the opportunities. That's what I'm in the business of. So on those days where I just think, oh, I've just, you know, that's it. I don't know what to do. I'm ringing Wendy and going, oh, Wendy. You know, and she reminds me as well. So, you know, it, it, for me, it mm. comes back to that part, which isn't marketing, isn't sales. But I, I think it's, you know, there's this whole mindset thing we've, we've got to just focus on too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's four, four things I would add to that, Simon. Go. Only four. Just only four the first one is change the language that you talk about bd to yourself with because otherwise you'll always find a reason not to do it so get rid of phrases like cold calling stop talking about chasing down clients because it makes it sound like they're running away which doesn't make it a very attractive thing to to imagine doing in the first place we don't chase leads we engage with prospects right so if you're going to do some BD tomorrow, let's call it customer engagement hour. And let's start to think of engaging reasons why they would want to talk to us. So if we invested a bit more time in a plan and a little less time fretting about why they don't want to talk to us, all of that time we spent worrying about why they want, don't want to talk to us, we could have spent 60 minutes coming up with reasons why they would, which goes back to what Wendy was saying, which is doing everything with purpose which then links to, to what Christine is saying, that you have to remember why you're in this business in the first place. Um, uh, second thing, rather, rather than deferring it through the day, do it as early as possible. Right? When, when you start to do it at nine o'clock and it's completed by 10.30, you then have the rest of the day to enjoy rather than a day pushing it back and giving yourself reasons why not this morning, I'll do it this afternoon and then this afternoon distracted by task. So I'll do it at four o'clock and then it falls into tomorrow's calendar and it, and it never actually arrives. So get up, log on, do that sales activity. Uh, and then the, the third, start, start every sales session or customer engagement session by phoning five good customers and get them to remind you how good you are. And then when they've reminded you how good you are and you can feel it, now phone some strangers because you've got the chemistry set that has just been set by your best customers. And if you do have what you feel is an adverse experience, then go back and phone another good customer so you can get another hit of endorphin and then pick up the phone or craft an email or whatever the thing is that is your BD flavor. Uh, and then lastly, uh, get, yourself a, get yourself a BD buddy, somebody in another business who you can hold to account to their BD activity and they hold you to account to yours and you positively lift each other rather than you drink wine every night together and talk each other out of doing it tomorrow. You can do that as well Jeremy can't you? You can still drink the wine afterwards. I think that's oh, an yeah, awesome completely. idea and how good would that be to use a team network to buddy up with people in sort of different sectors that they're targeting or different clients but with different functions. I think that's awesome mm -hmm. and I would still like the gin and tonic and wine afterwards though. And we could do it with worker so that we're all virtually together in the same office and we can we can feel a buzz rather than being in a back bedroom. 
Um, yeah. But Body, that, body's lift us and, and then we have a beer or a glass of wine afterwards. I, I think that's a great idea. I, I, almost by mistake, we started doing that with Andy Dunn, uh, in a, who's our regional director for team, is working with uh, Greg and Zach at Principal People and they've been push. They, all the three of them have been pushing each other and when they're, we're bounced, they have a, they had a weekly meeting, now they have a uh, bi-monthly meeting. Um, and they're just, they're pushing each other and encouraging each other with new ideas and sharing stuff that worked. We're in completely different markets, but that's one of the, I think, unique benefits of team that we can, we can go to, you can introduce people from one business to another, non-compete. They're not, one's not managing the other. They're, they're sharing some of their, uh, they're sharing some of their challenges, frustrations, and, and things they're scared of with each other, but not with their bosses, you know, so it's, it's been really productive idea. And I really encourage other team members, if you've got someone you can do that to, and I know hundreds already do. Um, but, but those of you that aren't find another local team member, speak to your regional director and uh, they'll introduce you to someone that's an, in of similar ilk and, and similar mindset. Um, anything else you want to add? Cause I want to cover some of these questions. We still have some open questions and some good ones and I can, uh, anything else you want to add folks before we, we leave that, uh, subject matter. Good. Um, right. We, um, question. The one about wine and Weetabix looks good. The wine and Weetabix. Uh, well, it was some a bit, loads have been answered. So I'm, I'm going to try and leave those for a moment. Um, Graham Brown's asked us, we've only ever used LinkedIn for marketing and I blog every day. Are we missing a trick with other platforms? What is the panel's recommendation? Now, you know who I'm going to go to first. Um, Christine, that one's for you. Others feel free to chip in. So um, if we were talking one-to-one, -one, I would be saying, okay, Graham, what are you actually doing on LinkedIn? Because it's, you know, it's one thing for for you to say you're using LinkedIn, but you know, if you're just throwing out posts, you're not doing any engagement on there, then you're not doing LinkedIn. Okay, so I would much rather have that conversation and say, right, on that initial platform, let's be 100% engaged on there, getting the most value out of it, using all the features you've got available to you. And if, that's, if it's not enough, then looking at your target market, you're looking at your objectives, from that, that decides where we go next. So, um, you know, if, again, you know, looking sort of sector by sector. So if you are kind of, you know, more commercial, you're not niching, then yeah, Facebook is probably a good place to go next. Um, but it is about, we, we, it's gonna be a different answer for everyone. All recruiters, I would say LinkedIn first, obviously. But then I come across recruiters that are using Instagram as a second platform. And I'm thinking, what the hell are you doing there? My favorite story was a oil and gas recruiter that decided they needed to be everywhere. And they were, put, they, they were putting all this effort into Pinterest. Well, Pinterest is where people go to create boards uh, to help them plan their wedding or decide what to put in the nursery and you know you, you're not going to get oil and gas candidates i don't think on pinterest so don't get pulled in by the shiny stuff make sure where you are you are leveraging before you dilute yourself further um, and if you are going into other platforms you're picking the right platforms for you to get to your target audience um this was a good question and, and, I, and Jeremy's answered it already, but I'm, I'm quite keen to post it again for other people. I often hear from consultants that they can't get hold of clients because of the lockdown or because they're working from home. What does Jeremy advise? And you, uh, you said, as Simon said, um, but you, you like the Vidyard product. Is that, is that, is that work well for you? And, and I think, get some good data and, and stuff. Christina, you've always given me good advice about having really good collateral to share and show to people. You know, one of the things we're trying to do uh, at Principal People is build a new market in quality and environment. And we've, we've rushed out to get big data to find out who's in those sectors. But then once you've got them, 
you've got to you've got to communicate some smart stuff to them, not just keep banging the phones at them saying, "Have you got any jobs?" So you you were really smart. So we we got a nice big wide funnel of contacts, but we've chosen some real smart uh, interactions to do to bring that to bring those people nearer to client, and um, uh, and that I think is absolutely vital. You've got to you've got to have some good stuff. Video is really good in there. Uh, testimonials, case studies. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, one of our team leaders has done, there's awards in our sector, in health and safety sector, and we put forward a couple of clients. Um, we put forward and nominated them for some awards, one on a tech one and one for most, uh, most influential health and safety professional of the year. And um, guess what happened? We got jobs out of both of them after they've been <laughs> Now the awards haven't even been judged yet. So, but but just recognizing actually genuinely how well someone had done in their job since we placed them there and keeping in touch with them and following their journey, actually caring about them made made them feel really engaged with us. So you can do you know think about um, other ways of communicating. Think about other ways of engaging. Um, there's lots of smart ways of doing that. I'm going to mention an, an individual again because we do work with them. Andy Dunn has used your tool, Jeremy, that you re recommended to everyone in lockdown, Duck Soup. What a great yeah. for engaging and building up a new database. Well, um, once, once Andy was getting connected to some of those people on Duck Soup and they were coming back and he was getting a 40 or 50% response rate of, of on 150 hits, uh, 150 miles a day, he was getting 60 or 70 come back. He was then stopping duck soup, but uh, sending those, some, uh, those 50 or 60 something personal and then following them on LinkedIn if they posted anything or commented on a thing. Uh, and then he was following up with the people that were commenting on those posts. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. one new contact he's engaged with. And all of a sudden he starts to follow the two or three that are obviously in the same market as, as that individual. And so he's, multi, he's using one new contact and creating two or three that are in exactly the same space with the right job titles and hierarchy. And uh, that's why, you know, at the start of lockdown, he had a, he, his business had stopped. He's now got a 200K um, pipeline of jobs in line. So I love that one. Um, here was a good one from Elke. Uh, oh no, no, we've covered that one. Sorry, folks. Let me let me try another one. Um, uh, Ross Cunningham, that, you might not want to answer this. Ross said, "Why are recruiters so lazy?" And we 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 tended to exhort that one. I think that's a frustration, perhaps, with that question that I posed to you, Wendy, um, of 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 the uh, subject. What, what can I do when I don't feel like business development? <laughs> I think I answered to somebody else, but Ross will know it's a rocket up their arse. <laughs> <laughs> do, you know um, what, do you know what, though? Don't forget that everybody is lazy. Like your client base, everyone, you, your, your clients, your candidate, they are all lazy. They all want to be spoon fed. Part of your job is to make life as easy as possible for them. So actually, let's embrace the lazy a little bit. Let's build that into our content strategies as well. You know, it, it's like, it's, it's everything from how you construct a, a communicate, how you construct an email marketing piece. Yeah. Okay. So I, I get that in terms of the, 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 the clients making it easy to buy. Totally get that. But I think I've just got to sort of go a wee bit. And I, I did answer, I, I joke when I say rock out there. Listen, you know, I remember from a couple of recessions I've been through in recruitment and I remember in my first recruitment business when we started the, 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 the recession I said this is the time now if you don't love recruitment get yourself out because yeah. you need to love recruitment right now so on a serious note if you do have problems <clears throat> um, with one of your members of staff just you know having to spoon feed them taking away all that negative energy from you and that sort of like you feel like you're going through the mud with them encourage them to find another another career because recruitment is 
great when it's great but the real recruiters come through the tough times and now we need the tough recruiters to get through it so i appreciate what you're saying from the client's point of view and making it easy to buy but i think it's really if somebody's sitting there and seeing somebody not do what they want you know start to have the words there's lots of people in recruitment today who've never been here like we've never been here any of us right but no one's actually been here in terms of when it was tough so it's been a gravy train that they would consider it to have been hard work because there's no other benchmark to compare it against, but now it's suddenly, it's hard work. And the unfortunate thing is too many recruiters choose the path of least resistance at each decision moment, which is really the path of maximum reward. So if they'd have resisted a little bit more in that conversation about a fee, or they'd resisted a little bit more about that temp not starting this week, but starting next week, and now they've bombed out and the client's blaming them, then there would have been less angst. But it's not, it's not their fault, if that makes sense. Like no, nobody goes to work trying to come up with creative ways not to make money. Everyone goes to work trying to be as creative as possible to ensure that deals happen. Um, so I, 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 I agree with what Wendy's saying too. I think there are people now who are starting to realize what hard work really is. And, and you can't you can't varnish that you you've got to adapt or you've got to make a different decision yeah I'm, I'm just laughing just to, to give um, everybody in the audience here I, I've got teams up as well and I've got my head of outreach just just not listening I don't think just now but he just emailed and his title is outreach and he's just asked to change his functional uh, division to black hole. So, you know, we're all feeling it. <laughs> okay. But I think it's having that joke around it, changing the language. And, uh, you know, I, I love that response. So we can call his function black hole, but he just has to <laughs> dig through it. <laughs> um, what, Christine, I just want to, I, I, I totally agree with you that um, one of the chat, that, that people are lazy. And clients are lazy. Um, uh, we've been doing a we've been doing an email campaign to a new market uh, and sending some big data. So we send a lot of emails and we send follow up emails for anyone that doesn't respond. On the first email, and we send five, we get a you know pathetic one percent response rate. On the third email, and, and it, it goes up. On the third email, we say, I don't know if you real. We sent you a couple of emails now about this really interesting subject. You haven't seen it yet should we not contact you in the future the response rate jumps to five and a half percent so you people don't see it but if you keep at them and it's automated so we're not actually doing anything you know a week later they don't respond the email goes they are lazy but they respond if you're persistent and and, and generally one of the things you always use always said is persistence and resilience in recruitment is amazing because Mm -hmm. The guys, the, 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 the main pack will fall away after two phone calls. So you've got to yeah. keep going. How many touch points is it, Christina, before people say yes sometimes? It keeps changing. Last, last thing I saw <laughs> was 12. Yeah. Keep, so it's, yeah. yeah it's I'm sticking um, with eight. Are you? You're sticking with I'm eight. With 10. Okay. Right, right. Eight <laughs> I'm going 12. 10, so I'm in between you all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're, I'm gonna I'm gonna save the um, I'm gonna save the questions and I'm gonna share I'll share them all with the um, with the panelists. If we think we haven't covered anything, I'm, I'll post I'll post some of the questions and the answers up on the website and do a, and and let all the uh, attendees have a look at that because I don't want us to have missed anything we might have done in the rush. We are over by one minute and I know there's some panelists here that have got a rush off to somewhere else. Um, I really thank you all for contributing today and I thank all those attendees that have hung in there as well. Uh, nearly all of you are still there. Thank you for that. We are going to be running um, uh, a lot more of these webinars, content rich webinars with uh, maybe similar service providers. Um, we'll come back to you. I'll come back to you folks again, but I've got another host of great service providers we're going to bring to the party as well. So we'll be covering lots of different subjects. I just whiz through a couple of those. How to build a temp desk. If you haven't done that before, how to build a contract desk. That's a very difficult, different thing. IR35 is going to come looming in the, into, the, into the spring. And I've got some very smart people um, with a good focus on that from the F, 
PSA, professional passport, and, and, and uh, separate champness. Um, bids and tenders and how to win, uh, creating an HR forum. HR forums are brilliant for building relationship with HR who, who, who you can, you don't even mention sales at those forums and all of a sudden they give you business afterwards because you've built their trust and a whole host of other things. Scaling, scale up webinar, those people who really want to come out of the COVID pandemic and really drive their business forward, expand and, uh, and, and cover other things. I'm going to, we're going to put out a list of probably 13 or 14 of those that we're going to do over the next three or four months um, with some great uh, panel guests. Thank you, folks. Thank you, uh, wonderful panelists, for your contribution today. Look forward to seeing you all soon. Probably, Thanks, Simon. Probably on Zoom, but um, one day we'll meet. Cheers. Thanks for having us. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.